This episode of Uzo Talk is brought to you by Kingsford Smith Transport. Have a group that needs transporting? KST has you covered with their fleet of professionally maintained buses and coaches, catering from 9 to 57 passengers and driven by experienced drivers. Visit kstbuses.com.au to talk to the team and make your booking. Kingsford Smith Transport, proud sponsors of the Uzo Talk podcast. There's no Uzo Talk without a bottle of Uzo, which is why we love the Greek Provador. Get a real taste of the very best produce that Greece has to offer. From olive oils and delicious artisan sweets to unique spirits, earthy herbs and memorable wines. Visit thegreekprovador.com.au to see their amazing range. The Greek Provador, proud sponsors of the Uzo Talk podcast. Sound is. Hey guys, Tom here with a quick message before we get into this episode of the podcast. It's Easter time and Nick and I are actually in different parts of the world. I'm in Greece right now to celebrate with family. Nick is still in Sydney, so it's a little bit hard to do an episode, or at least a fresh one anyway, which is why we are rewinding the clock a little bit with this episode that we did on how to celebrate and how to go about having a Greek Easter. This one's from a couple of seasons ago, but it still holds true. So strap yourself in, pour yourself an ouzo or a coffee, start making those tureka and get into the Easter spirit. Let's talk about Easter because we're in the middle of Lent right now. Mm -hmm. It's coming up to it. It's probably the most important event on the Greek calendar. What does it mean to your family, Nick? Yeah, for us, I guess it's all about family, family unity. It's a a culture thing. Yes, it's about Jesus and so forth, but it's more about bringing the family together. It's a great time of year and I just got really fond memories as a kid. You know, mum and dad, brother and sister are all my family, all my cousins. We go to church. And it's like a reunion at church. You know, you see people you Absolutely. went to Greek school with or primary school or played football with. It's like a reunion of all the Greek community and everyone dresses, their, put, puts on their best clothes. And yeah, it's, it's a great time. I actually look forward to it every year. Mm. You know, even now as an adult, I want to see my, experiencing it through my kids now. You know, yeah. just this, how funny is it? It's 11 o'clock on a Saturday and there's no one inside at the church and about 11.05 just a swarm of people just start to come in <laughs> it's like a tsunami of people all yeah. of a sudden shit where'd all these people come from and you go to Cogra I think you said we do time. yeah yeah that's our church yeah it's huge don't quote me on the numbers but all I remember was church is full they got upstairs it's full everyone down the stairs full on the main road footpath full road yep. full Left and right of the road, which is goes about fifty meters either end, it's just packed. You know, I want to say thousands and thousands, but uh, I'm sure some of all know. But yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, and even just trying to get out, it's just a mayhem. I love it. I love it's it just as big, and I don't, I don't know if it's even bigger in some in, in some instances at Saint Spiridon Church in Kingsford mm-hmm. here in is Sydney. That your church? That's where we go to. Yep. That's where uh, you know I was baptized, and the whole family goes to big. Com- big Greek community around mm. there, so mm-hmm. St. Spirit on Church. Mm. Again, one of the biggest parishes, I'd say, in, in Sydney. It's definitely huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they they shut off, every year they shut off all of, uh, on either side of the church. Mm. And it is absolutely packed Friday and Saturday night. This is a big main road <laughs> that, yeah. they, that they shut off. And yeah, it is just a sea of people every year. It's yeah. unbelievable. It's it's beautiful to see. Yeah, no, it is. And even the Friday as well, when they do the epitaphio and they and they do the lap of honor around the yeah. church as well. <laughs> Don't you love how, how everyone calls it the lap of honor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember one year, a couple of non Greeks because yep. you go around walking around the streets, yep. and they wanted to leave. Yep. And they and before they realised, a swarm of people holding candles were walking past them. <laughs> And there was one, there was one particular car with four people in it trying to get out of the street. They had parked, and uh, they couldn't get out. They were doing like you know five k's, and the people are walking, looking at them, giving them dirty looks as yep. they're walking past their car. <laughs> it was funny. So they're thinking, shit, what is going on here? There's no one here about an hour ago. <laughs> now everyone's walking past with candles, staring at me, dressed to the nines, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's good stuff. It's yeah. good stuff. Also, it, it's a bit of. 
when the epiduffial comes out, it's a non or isn't it to walk underneath it? Yeah, so you if you go, that? yeah, there's a lot of people. That, that was more of a tradition that I had learnt in Greece when I was there for Easter a few years ago. Mm-hmm. So the whole thing was, okay, the epitaphio comes out and, you know, people are trying to go underneath it because it's a, you know, it's a good luck. Or, good luck. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> For yeah. me, it was always a case of you go, you know, naproskinesis, you know, you go up, you know, kiss the you know, the icon of the epitaphio, you know, yeah. whatever, take a flower from it. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's part of the tradition, but... <laughs> yeah, it's for good luck. <laughs> Absolutely. Everything's Absolutely. for good luck. That's it, that's it. See, we're lucky guys, me and you. <laughs> we I mean, are, mate, we are. We are. I did it one year too, I remember. It's just yeah, trying to get through and you got little old ladies trying to get underneath and you're trying to be respectful. The season yeah. ticket holders. That's right, yeah. <laughs> the regulars, front row. Yeah. Mate, they know the priest by name. They yep. do, yeah. But we did go through actually and they leaned up Grab that little uh, flower as well. Yep. Yep, we're going to have luck for the year. But yeah, it's a big thing, isn't it, to walk underneath it? Apparently so. I don't know I don't know the full tradition as to, as to why, but I mean, it's important to mention, not everyone's particularly religious in, mm-hmm. uh, in the community, but despite that, it feels as though Greek communities throughout the diaspora tend to come together around our churches. Mm-hmm. It's morphed into something that's more of a family event as opposed to a religious one. The two go hand in hand. Is that something that you re- that you reckon is true? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a cultural thing. You know, a lot of people probably aren't religious, mm. but it's a cultural thing. It's something that we do. It's habitual, and it's a and it's all good. It's all about celebration and eating and drinking yep. and being festive as well. So, but you're right. It's you know I don't see that many people on church on a Sunday, but somehow they come out of the woodwork for Easter. You've got to be at church on Sunday to to, to know that. Do you go on Sunday? <laughs> I used to go. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I think we used to do it. We used to go Sunday morning for Kinonia. Mm. We would try to go. And that was, was that it? Was that the Saturday morning or the Sunday morning? I can't remember whether there, there was literally a line around the corner to go for Kinonia. Yeah, I think it was the fraud. No, it was the Saturday. The Saturday it? morning. Yeah, was it was the Saturday. Do you remember as a kid, I'd blow up. I think, oh, is this it? Do I finally get to eat my chocolate Easter eggs? Yes. <laughs> and get, no, not yet. Oh. So I thought church on the Friday, okay, I get to open these beautiful yeah. Easter eggs. I used to have this um, Humpty Dumpty was my favourite. Oh, I yeah. Had Smarties with the Smarties inside. in it. Yeah. And I thought, what a, what a waste of space. It's all empty, but yeah. I filled it with Smarties. Oh, that's a great idea. Get more chocolate. <laughs> but I could never eat it on a Friday. And then we yeah. had the Kinonisi on a Saturday. I go, Mark, can we have it now? Or keep it in a minute. Oh, fuck. Yeah. And then Saturday, how, what a drag Saturday was. Remember? <laughs> Like you couldn't go to sleep, you're up at, you know, eight, nine, ten. Oh yep. my god. You're half asleep as yep. a kid, seeing all these beautiful chocolates and then finally you get the green light, we go to church yep. and Yeah, that waiting period, that was that was I remember that was a killer. And it's the kid. signal to eat meat as well, obviously. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but we unbeknown to us, we didn't realise we were vegans, you know, during the Easter period. Yeah. You know, like we were young six, seven year old kids. I didn't know. Mum whatever mum cooked we ate. Yeah. And um, yeah, there was no meat, feta. Yeah. But yeah. it was a good time actually. It was a really good um, cleansing diet for us with unbeknown. Absolutely. To us. So we're probably the original vegans. What do you reckon? Absolutely. I mean, we would eat things like um, like briam. So, like a, for those who don't know, it's like a ratatouille type of thing in the oven. Araka or bizelia, as a lot of people know it. So you the know, peas store. Yep. Yeah, so peas with with, uh, with potatoes and mm. aguinares and all that all that sort of stuff. Just you know, fantastic. And you wouldn't realize that it's not mm. that there's no meat in it. Yeah. Until someone in the family said, we haven't eaten meat for a while, and then you can't get it out of your head yeah. <laughs> for the next few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a sweet too, so for me it was always about the chocolate. But yeah, we used to have, remember Bumyas? Yes. Ugh. Okra. I used to hate that stuff. Yeah. But yeah, we had, that's all we had to eat. We had that, <laughs> fuck yes, uh-huh. all the legumes and so forth. Love but, fuck yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I do now. Yeah. <laughs> Back then it was like a drag. Oh my God, yeah. how can you eat this stuff? It, Even just for the name of it. That was always... Yes, and bum. Yes, oh, I'm yeah. eating bums. What's going on? <laughs> Everyone's got a joke about telling their friends about fuck yes as a kid. Yeah. It's like, what are you eating? Fuck yes. What? <laughs> Excuse <Classic>. me? <laughs> yeah. oh. It means lentil soup. Now, we've got a lot of words with that synonym, haven't we? Seal. How do you say seal in Greek? Fuck yeah. <laughs> How do you say uh, mousetrap? Fuck <laughs> Uh, envelope. Fuck <laughs> it, 
Fucking awesome there. We got <laughs> fuckheads. Outstanding. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah, that's it. There's four of them, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. So uh, a seal, uh, a lentil-eating seal holding an envelope steps yeah. on a mouse trap. <laughs> so that ingrained. <laughs> <laughs> that is outstanding. Oh, oh, oh jeez. No, good it's stuff. Good. So tell us about your experience growing up as a kid. You know, Easter, what, what are your fond memories? You know, everything was a lead up to that Sunday morning. You know, mm-hmm. when, we, when we would wake up really early, you know, me and my papu would go outside and start the karuna basically for the, you know, for the arni and, mm. you know, or for the... Uh, what do you call it the kodoshuli or whatever we were going to have that day usually it would be a whole lamb mm-hmm. so i was really involved from a really young age because i wanted to take it over mm. <laughs> very quickly which which i have now with uh, yeah. with my cousin steve so mm-hmm. yeah it was all it was always about that i as as a younger kid i really liked going to church mm-hmm. and seeing all of that you know all of that thing and the service the liturgy and all that sort of thing. I was really interested as a kid, you know, became mm. a little less religious, you know, grow, <laughs> growing up, but still really, you know, really enjoy doing it at that time of year and love, mm. you know, taking, you know, my, my little one now as well. I think it's really important, you know, that they have these mm. special, you know, these special events. As with everything, as you get a little bit older and you've got kids, it becomes more about them. Yeah. You know, so it's more about, you know, making it special for mm. making it special for them. For me personally, I was never really preoccupied with the chocolate side of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and part of it is because I think my dad's got an obsession with chocolate. Okay. I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to out him again. I've outed dad a few times on this podcast. Poor <laughs> Philip. I know. Yeah, like I said, dad's got this preoccupation, this, this obsession with chocolate. He's tall and thin, but he could eat as much chocolate as you, as you can imagine and doesn't gain any weight now. For years, what would happen around Easter is, you know, family members would bring us, you know, the big chocolate eggs and, you know, like the, the, yeah. the Humpty Dumpty. Or yeah. There was a... <laughs> And we would put them all on this bar that we had at home at the like time. A display. Yep. Yeah. You know, you know where, <laughs> where, you, where your family's got the Kala Cristala? Oh, that's right. You know, all yeah. of that. We had a bar too. <laughs> yes. I remember that bar. We had one as well. For, Full for of a while. alcohol. The one that's got like all the good crystal glasses yeah. and all that sort of thing. Yeah, as yeah. a display. Yeah, that's underneath it. the bar was just full. I remember oh, okay, right, right. those kids. Like, yeah. Oh my God. Now the alcohol was in a separate place for us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, there was this little table there. And what would happen is people would bring us chocolate, mm-hmm. you know, family members, aunts, uncles, you know, godparents, whatever. My brother and I would split it into two sections. So one side would be mine, the mm-hmm. other side would be his. And what would happen over the, over the coming weeks, we'd slowly chip away at it. This one year, though, someone brought me an egg shaped as a football, like mm-hmm. a rugby league ball, okay. an NRL <laughs> Easter egg, which was fantastic. And you kicked it. <laughs> it, it took pride of place right in the middle of this bar right yeah. a few weeks after easter we're chipping away at all this chocolate and dad's eating most of it mm. right i'm having a i'm having a little bit but it's mostly for him yeah so of an evening dad would say you know go, go and grab something you know go and bring bring some over here as we're watching tv as all the chocolate was going this nrl easter egg gets left and he keeps saying to me come on go, go and crack it i go nah that's the only one that i really want i could just leave that that's going to be for me you know to have you know whenever i want and he goes, no, nah, no, nah, come on, come on, you know, you're not going to eat all that by yourself. And he's, you know, trying to trying to twist my arm about it. He got to the stage where, you know, two weeks had passed, three weeks had passed, and he's still, you know, he's still getting into me about this egg. Mm. And eventually I said, look, I'm not going to bloody open it. You know, you've had all the rest of mine. Just be happy with that. Just leave that one for me. Mm. Anyway, so I, w- I walk inside, I had the shits, and I heard mum say, uh, say to dad, why won't you just let him have that? You know, stop, you know, stop pestering him. You know, you've had all the other ones that he, you know, that he had. Yeah. And she goes, seriously, she goes, I'm surprised that you haven't, you know, cracked it open and started eating it from behind. And he goes, how did you know? Oh. And she looks at him. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, you're kidding, right? <laughs> and I'm, I can hear this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I walk outside. So the egg was in this, you know, this cardboard box with plastic around it and whatever. And it was covered in foil. So I go and have a look. I open the top of it. And the back half that you couldn't see missing. was all crumpled <laughs> and was missing. Philip. There was thought put into this, right? Yeah. He went and took a really sharp knife, mm-hmm. ran it under a hot tap, <laughs> carefully <laughs> peeled it, <laughs> and started slicing into the back of it <laughs> and eating it in secret. <laughs> wow. It was just leaving the front. <laughs> Very clever. Okay. And I, I have a look at him. I'm like, you're sick. <laughs> I go, I go, I'm too impressed to be angry. I yeah. can just have it. 
<laughs> what a classic. Good oh, on you. Oh, jeez. Oh, there we go. I think yeah. you do, eh? Yeah. I think you do. What Mate, a classic. He's ill. Yeah, classic. <laughs> Mate, speaking of that bar, it just brought back fond memories. Yeah, go on. You know, we were like 16, 17. We used to sneak behind the bar. And, we, and I remember mum and dad had all these amazing scotches and ouzo bottles. And, and as kids, we weren't kids, so like teenagers, yep. 16, say. We, we'd sneak out behind the bar and have a look and fuck, check out all these bottles of alcohol. We'd unscrew the lid and we'd fill the lid cap <laughs> of the liquid with little shots. <laughs> Put the lid back on it and sort of crawl back out of the bar again as if nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah, fond memories. How yeah. drunk would you get with your cousins? We didn't drink too many, yeah. but yeah, we, we did feel a bit, how you going? Yeah, but that was our first, my first uh, taste of alcohol <laughs> behind that bar, <laughs> drinking out of a, a lid cap yeah. of uh, scotch, but yeah. And would your parents, Jerry, or what, would they realise? I don't know, actually. I had an older brother, so yeah. I think he probably caught the blame of it. Yeah, so, ah, it's probably Bill. You know, yeah. Drinking it. <laughs> Little I know, it's me. Your dad's measuring all the, all, yeah. all the bottles. Oh, we had heaps. Like back then, name days were huge. So if someone yeah. would come over, we, we'd have like, you know, a shitload of families come over. They'd all bring a bottle of something. Yeah. So every year, we we'd, you know, this thing would get bigger and bigger and yeah. we'd have so much alcohol. I don't think they'd even realise if anything went missing. Yeah. So... <laughs> But yeah, no, back to Easter. Yeah, that was, they're good memories, uh, Tom. I remember when I was a kid, we, we'd go into church. I think it was the Friday or the Saturday during the day. I remember the priest would walk down or the priest's assistants, whatever they were. Yep. And they'd, they'd move the chandeliers and they'd have these big cane baskets of um, bay leaves. Ah, yes. And they'd throw it to the yep. crowd. Was that... that was meant to be what an earthquake. As soon as when Jesus died was the earthquake. I think that's I can't what remember which day it is that that happens on. But yeah, there's a yeah there is a tradition where basically the priest comes out and they they throw all this stuff. There's actually a really funny video on on YouTube that's been used to death on a show called Radio Arvilla. Okay, <laughs> in yeah. Greek TV, which I love. Yeah, uh, and they took the piss out of this priest so bad yeah. <laughs> because there's this, there's this shot. They've set the camera up right right down the the aisle. Yeah. And what happens is the door of the, the altar mm-hmm. opens up yeah. and the priest comes racing out, like bombing down the aisle, throwing, throwing leaves all over the place. <laughs> and there's a jump. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're seeing rasa going everywhere. You're seeing leaves going everywhere. It's Classic. brilliant. But I'm not sure which, which day that actually yeah. is. I think it's the Saturday morning. I think it's meant to represent there was an earthquake when right. Jesus died on the cross. Right. So he died on the Friday, I think. Yes. Yeah, so I think it would have been Saturday morning session. Mm. Yeah, and it was a big event. I remember it was huge. The season ticket holders would cop <laughs> most of the the bay leaves <laughs> yeah. in your face. And, and it was funny, you watch everyone walk out at church and they got bay leaves in their yeah. hair and <laughs> back of their clothes. And again, you had to grab one for good luck. Of course. Everything's good of luck. Of course, of course. And the yeah. more you grab, the yeah, exactly. more luck you've got, right? Yeah. I remember one year I no. saw one particular priest had like handfuls. He must have had the shits that day. It was just fucking branding it at people, just throwing <laughs> it at people's faces. <laughs> and the chandeliers were going, you know, virtually at right angles. <laughs> sway. They're going, shit, what happened to this guy? Uh, Pissed dear. off he had to get up so yeah. early. <laughs> There's some interesting traditions when it comes to Easter and from all over Greece as well. Mm. I mean, we've spoken about a few and maybe, maybe this is a good time to talk about some of those traditions. As you know, you know, my, my family's from Corfu and Corfu is one of those places that has some awesome Easter traditions and mm. so much so that a lot of Greeks actually go to Corfu during Easter to experience it because of, uh, because of the spectacle that there is. In particular, there's this one thing that happens on... Um, on Easter Saturday, the the Botides. Mm. I don't know if you've seen this, but basically, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, so basically, in the in the square, in the main square of Corfu town, what they do basically is they've got these big clay pots, and they're painted red, or they, they you know they paint them different colours. They fill them with water, mm-hmm. and I think it's at midday or something something along those lines. They actually throw them over the balcony, and they shatter on the ground, mm. and there is fair income over a hundred thousand people in that square. <laughs> It's yeah. unbelievable. I experienced it in 2019. First time in my life. I'd been told from a very young age that Easter in, uh, in Corfu was pretty special. Mm. I was just like, how special could it be? And people kept telling me, so special that people from other parts of Greece go there. I'm like, mm. all right. All right we'll I actually see it on the news. It's actually huge. Yeah, it's, it's massive. It's a, the whole world 
focuses in on it. Yeah. Do you know what the tradition is? What 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 does it represent? So similar to what you were talking about before, the symbolism is to create an earthquake. That's like the one that occurred following Christ's resurrection from his tomb, and mm-hmm. perhaps it's to symbolise you know the cracking of the, the stone or the moving of the stone or something along those lines. Islanders also believe that it's to ward off bad spirits and. The spectators basically take a shard from the from the clay pots because guess what? It's for good luck. It's good luck. <laughs> hey, people from Corfu are very lucky. That's all I can say. Absolutely. <laughs> what a classic. We had such good luck that when I took my shard in 2019, we had COVID the very next year. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And look what's happened. I know. We've got a podcast out of it. Absolutely. See? There you go. You got your good luck. <laughs> That's it. But yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's it's a fantastic spectacle. And like I said, the whole square is filled up. Mm. You know, and this is this is one of the biggest squares in Europe, and it is just a sea of people. Mm-hmm. And what happens is, I'd say standing room only. Yeah. There's no standing room. You're literally sardines, right? Okay. And what happens is because those people that are close to the buildings, mm-hmm. they need to move back, otherwise they're going to get hit with a pot. What the owners of the of the houses and the apartments do is they start yep. throwing water out of the out of the windows a few minutes before okay. to make sure that people move back. And when the bells at Saint Spiridon start yep. ringing, they start throwing things out the window. Wow! <laughs> so does this happen at midnight? Now this is during the day. During the day, like on during the Friday day. or the Saturday. I think it's the Saturday. That happens. All the marching bands, you know, there, there are like twenty odd marching bands on the island. You know, mm. massive ones. They all start playing. You know, there's a whole there's a whole thing that uh, you know that happens there. There's a procession that happens. Yeah. And it is just mayhem for a you wow. know for a few minutes there. All you can hear is you know things breaking everywhere. It's sort of ingrained in in us, isn't it? You know, breaking plates, breaking pots. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> To break something. Yeah. Are there any injuries ever? Do you ever see any people get shards of clay pot in the eye or it must happen. Everyone yeah. says, nah, 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 it's never happened. Yeah. You know, but it must happen somewhere. You says know. says the guy with the missing eye. Nah, yeah, it never that's happens. It. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it actually yeah. happens all over the island. So, yeah. you know, at, at that time yep. they do start throwing it, you know, throwing it out everywhere. And yeah. what my mum said as well, mm-hmm. growing up, because she grew up in uh, in Corfu as well. Yeah. When they heard the uh, the bells at Saint Spiridon and people started throwing things, that's the time that my papu would slaughter the Easter lamb oh, as right. well. Okay. So when that happened, that's when the you know that's the signal to start cutting. Wow, shit. <laughs> yeah, is that why they don't have any uh, old ancient terracotta pots in Corfu? Because <laughs> yeah, n- nothing's safe at that point. <laughs> They've been broken. Nothing's safe. <laughs> No, we can't find any terracotta pots here. Everywhere yeah. else we do, except for Corfu. That's it. <laughs> Some little kid grabbed it and threw it out the window. That's where pots go to die, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting because there are some people in that square that do... They've got like a tradition. So there's one guy in the mm-hmm. main square there that does a massive pot every year. Yeah. And he paints it in the colours of the island's soccer team. Okay. Uh, what, or Gedgira. Or Gedgira. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. What colours are they? Blue and red, basically. Blue and red. Okay. And he's, he writes, oh, get, get on it and yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's that's a big one. So everyone knows every year this is the one that's going to, you know. It's like the grand finale. Well, it's one of them. There's a few There's a few people that do similar ones, but they do massive ones. They stand up on the top of the building and they're, you know, signaling to everyone to count down, you know, from five. You know, five, four, three, two, one, bang. You know, wow. it, it's, it becomes a, you know, it's, it's quite, a, quite a spectacle. Yeah. It's brilliant. Look, funny you say that. In Ipiro, Ipiro's dotted with Venetian castles mm. as well. I believe Breveza does that as well. But they go into a main square. Is that right? Mm, they don't throw them off a balcony. From right. what I understand, that they all bring their little pots in, there, like they're big as your hand, maybe a little bit bigger. And they all go around the square, and then at a certain time, they just smash it onto the ground. Yeah, right. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> so it must be something to do with... The Venetians or... Well, funny you should mention that. So I did a little bit of research. The exact origin of the custom is unclear. And according to the municipality of Corfu, one popular belief is that it originated with the Venetians, who were obviously on the island between, you know, I think 14th and 18th centuries. And it was to mark the new year initially. And the Venetians would throw out their old belongings to make way for new ones in order to make a fresh start to the year. That's apparently where it sort of originates. And they just appropriated that, moved it to Easter. And now it's part of the tradition. Mm. Very there you go. Stuff. Yeah, love it. Love all that. And yeah. it's only unique to Corfu. That's it. All that part. And Brevazo, yeah. I guess, stood in a, a smaller version. Yeah. 
Yeah, fascinating. Well, we try and do it here as well on our balcony. <laughs> do you really? Yeah, yeah. So my uh, my Bethany usually sends us a couple of uh, of pots from from Corfu. Fantastic. We just break them on the balcony there. I want to throw it out the window though. I want to see it fall three stories. Yeah, you should. I think fuck. There's another domestic going on. <laughs> yeah. Tom's uh, pissed off Dimitra. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, classic. No, yeah. good stuff. Yeah, so where my parents are from, they're from mum's from a place, uh, it's called La Banitza. Yep. So it's deep, it's part of Suli. So right. So it's, it's a part of Suli. So Suli is the main town. Historic it, town. It is. And there's all these suburbs, and this is a, a part of Suli. It's called La Banitza, but they changed the name to El Ataria. Actually, I've got a, um, a document to say there was 30, no, 50 families that lived in La Banitza in 1579. So there was this guy that went to Istanbul, and he got all these. Uh, doc- he bought all these documentation. So apparently, the Ottomans were really good at keeping records. Yep. And he bought all these records and documentation. I reached out to him. I said, "Do you have anything in Labanitsa?" And he goes, "Yes, I do." And he goes, "In 1579, I've got all the names of the families that lived there." He goes, "There was no wow. widows and 22 bachelors." And I thought, "Wow, wow, yeah, amazing." So that's how long this village has been running for. And the tradition hasn't really changed much in those 400 years from what my mum was saying. She goes, uh, every year it's the same thing and her great-grandfather who lived there and so forth did the same tradition. And they do what we do today, essentially. You know, they, they celebrate, they, they feast for 40 days uh, with Lent. Uh, they go to church every Sunday. Mum used to say she, they go to the local uh, beekeeper and he'd collect all the wax and make these lambadas for the kids and every Sunday for the 40 days, they'd go to church. They'd light the candle. And as soon as they left the church, they'd distinguish the candle. Yeah. So they'd try and make it last for the 40 days. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, what else did she say? Yeah, apparently her dad used to buy them brand new clothes every Easter. Wow. So all the kids would get new shoes, new clothes for Easter. That was a actually yeah. tradition. Yeah. I remember as a kid, I think, well, my, um, my godparents would always do that. It was always like, you know, buy new shoes, buy new stuff, basically. With your godparents, they usually buy the kid a la bada as mm-hmm. well. So there's always a, you know, very impressive candle of some, <laughs> of some yep. description. That's right. That whole thing about renewal and new stuff, you know, kind of speaks to what we were just talking about with the body this as well. You know, yeah, it's okay. out with the old, in with the new type of thing. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Interesting symbolism. It is. Yeah. And um, the feast would always happen on the Sunday. So yep. uh, mum would say that... The, Virtually the whole hill would be look like a be a smoking from all the right. all the souvlis happening. Oh, how good's that? Yeah, and I'd say, what, what did what did you all eat? She goes, it was all it was all lamb. It's the only time of yeah. the year we'd have lamb, or well, twice a year they'd have yeah. lamb, and the whole hill would be lit up with all these families cooking their own version of lamb, you know, yep. and their own ingredients how and how to marinate it. But yeah, it's a great tradition. And mum said it was the best time of the year. She loved it yeah. every year. Everyone would get together. Because after lunch, then the, the, the clarina would start playing. That's <laughs> All the dancing yep. would start happening. And yeah, she goes, it would go for at least two days, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was huge. Yeah. Everyone says that Easter over there is very different. Now that I've experienced it, Mm-hmm. They're actually right. It's on a whole other level there. Yeah. Like here it's big and it's big within the family, but it's on a whole other level when everyone, when it's everyone that's celebrating at the same time. Yeah. And even, again, I can only speak from Corfu's perspective, but mm-hmm. even the Catholics on, um, on Corfu, there's actually a large Catholic basilica on the island. Mm. They celebrate Easter at the same time as the Orthodox do because of the fact that it's such a big deal. So they, they actually don't observe Easter at, uh, at the Catholic time. They observe it on the Orthodox calendar. Mm. Yeah, so is that something to do with the old calendar, the Julian calendar? Yeah, that's right. So, As opposed to the Gregorian, which is what we use today? Yeah, so my understanding is that... So the Orthodox calendar, basically, what they say is Jewish Passover basically needs to happen first before you can have Easter. Okay. And that's how the Orthodox do it, whereas the Catholics don't take Passover into account, which is kind of significant because when you think about... The Last Supper that happens on Thursday, mm-hmm. that was a Passover meal. Mm. So kind of makes sense in some, you know, in some respects that you would need to observe Passover first mm-hmm. and then have Easter. Mm. I kind of agree with that. Logical, that's for sure. Yeah. Obviously, the calendar that we observe works astronomically now. But in terms of the religious aspect of it, yeah, I agree. You know, Passover needs to happen first before we can have Easter. 
It's interesting mm. stuff. <laughs> it is, definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, there's a reason why we have these customs and traditions. And sometimes we forget. Mm. We forget why we do it. But yeah. It's, yeah, it does make sense. Yeah, yeah well done, mate. Let's look at one other tradition in Greece. Mm-hmm. The rocket wars in here. Have you seen this? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yes, it is. It's mad. It's insane. <laughs> it's very Greek, isn't it? It is mad. Okay, so for those who don't know or maybe haven't seen it, in Chios, there are these two villages where the, there's a church, obviously, in each one, and they've obviously got a bell tower in each one. And somehow this tradition started somewhere in the Middle Ages or some, you know, somewhere along the lines where they would fire homemade rockets at the other church trying to hit their bell tower. And it's just turned into an absolute war <laughs> every year. <laughs> it's all in good fun. Like there's, there's obviously a bit of banter between the two villages and whatnot. But it's absolutely insane. If you see the videos of it, mate, there are fires happening. <laughs> you know, the trees are lighting up and all that sort of thing. You know, it's insane. Yeah, it is. I've seen it. It's crazy. It's like uh, they've lined up all these rockets and one guy just runs with a, a lit torch and yeah. lighting them all up and all of a sudden <laughs> a dozen rockets go flying trying to hit their bell tower. Yeah. And I think every time they do hit a bell tower, a cheer goes up. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It's insane. And you can imagine the firefighters would be very nervous that time of year. Oh, yeah. Know. They're on standby. I saw a video where basically they had the fire engine somewhere and someone was calling back. I think the fire engine was stationed somewhere in between the two villages and someone called that a tree had caught fire. Mm-hmm. Apparently, this fire engine couldn't move from where it was. It was sort of, uh, you know, closed in or whatever the case is. Anyway, by the time they got there, the tree had already had already burned. <laughs> it was gone. Singed. It was coal yeah. by, the t- by the time they got there. Oh, <laughs> they make these homemade rockets and apparently there's a you know pe- people are experimenting all the time to see what the right recipe and the right you know portion of uh, charcoal versus powder yeah I don't, I don't know what it is I, I remember someone said that there's charcoal in it okay they grind everything down to a fine powder mm-hmm. uh, we won't give instructions on how to make it on, on the show because we don't <laughs> encourage that sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, f- effectively, people just make as many uh, as many rockets as they can, and they just start firing them at the, op- the opposing church. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's such a great spectacle. Yeah, you know? and they always record it, you know, yeah. and it always gets uh, posted around the world. Just amazing of uh, a spectacle of all these rockets from one end to another, and, yeah. and everyone's cheering and. People are dodging them. I don't, I don't understand how no one gets hurt out of this. They ask people over there, like, oh, yeah, have there been any injuries? And people, people are like, nah, nah, it's all right. And then you've, you've always got that one bloke who's like, oh, if you know what you're doing, there's yeah. no injuries. It's like, yeah, <laughs> okay. Settle me. Yeah. yeah. This is an exit there, mate. <laughs> Says the guy with one eye. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine doing something like that here? Nah, I can't. <laughs> Get arrested. Work health and safety, you know, public... Public safety. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, it doesn't exist. Imagine the insurance on an event like that. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to fire, you know, 300 rockets in the, you know, into the opposing suburb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're mad. And that's uh, the thing. And then once that finishes, they just get into their festivities, don't they? That's it. Start that's drinking, it. hitting the ouzo. It's the way know. to do it. And uh, yeah, so alcohol, so I'm just reading here. So actually, my mum was reminding me in La Benitza, They'd make all their red wine, and then they'd have all this ouzo. So they'd drink what we drink, mate. Really? Ouzo is the drink Fantastic. at Easter time. How good's that? Well, see, well, you know, we're upholding something. Easter traditions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just another reason to drink more ouzo. Yeah. Another really interesting thing about uh, Easter in Greece is the look of Santorini during Easter. I don't know if you've ever seen it at night, you know, with all these people holding candles, you know, all these villages, you know, sort of dotted along the island. Mm -hmm. And I suspect it would look similar everywhere else as well. But that sort of contrast between the white houses Mm. lit up by candlelight and people doing their processions and all that sort of thing, it Mm. is unbelievable. Oh, can you imagine? It's a beautiful island, the best of times, but having it lit up with candles, yeah, it would be amazing. Uh Yeah. So what's your theory on candles, mate? Do you have like a little cup holder when you're sitting there for an hour? Mate, I'm cheating now. You're I'm cheating. cheating because Ikea has these great little um, lanterns. Okay. So you, you get one of those for like, you know, eight bucks or whatever it is. You're getting and soft. You're, I am, mate, I am. But, you know, it makes it makes the transport home easier. Yeah, it does. You know, because once you put it in there, you know, you've got your li- either a little tea light or a yep. or a little candle or whatever it, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. All you've got to do is hold this little lantern there and there's no problem. Whereas back in the day, as you well know, you'd get in the car, you'd be getting weird looks from cops on the way home and, <laughs> you know, getting pulled over. 
and all that sort of thing. It's like, why have you got an open flame in your car? Yeah. You know? But now, you know, it's pretty safe. You just keep it in your little lantern and it's yeah. not going to blow out, you know? That whole, you know, that anxiety of going home and thinking, oh my God, if this goes out, it's bad luck. Yeah. <laughs> Can't have that. Yeah. <laughs> We've had all this good luck. I know, right? Kind of, that one bad luck thing was to wipe everything yeah, out. It's uh, a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can undo everything. That's right, yeah. What blows me away is all the, the elder generation who yep. sit there and hold a candle. and the Again, waxes, the season ticket holders. Yeah, the season ticket holders, wax going all over their hand. They don't even flinch. 80-year-old ladies, eh, it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> if they always me, boy, they, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, interestingly, I don't know if you've ever seen this. So you know that the flame that's passed around basically comes from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which they say lights oh. spontaneously in the tomb of Christ every year. They say to you that when that flame comes out each year, I don't know if you've ever seen I've actually ever seen been it. there. Were you there for it? No, not for okay. it. But yeah, I'll tell you a story in a second. Okay. I'll tell you a story. Yeah. So what they say is basically when that comes out, people start passing this, this flame around and sharing it around. It doesn't burn you. So there's people there touching the flame and doing all that sort of and putting it on their face and stuff. And they swear blind that you can't get burnt with it. Didn't we do that when we were kids? <laughs> you'd, you'd run your finger across the yeah. flame. <laughs> Sometimes you'd try and put it out yeah. with your finger to I show how strong you were. Yeah. In fairness, I haven't seen anyone sort of hold their hand right in the flame. There's always a little bit, little bit of separation, but that's what they say. Wow. But we don't get the fresh flame every year. It's from last year, apparently. So okay. we've got the flame from last year. Oh, do we? Okay. I think that's so the way you're behind. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Whereas in Greece, mm-hmm. the flame comes from Jerusalem on a presidential jet. Wow. They're very serious about it. Yeah. In a lantern. Not like the Nikea lantern, but a proper one. <laughs> hey, I'm sure it would be. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it happens every year. There's a there's a band there to, to greet it. To, to greet it. Yeah. Yeah. your force. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic, yeah. It's a big deal. It is. Yeah, look, it's an amazing place, the Holy Sepulchre Church. I went there years ago. You walk in, Greek priests everywhere. Yep. You walk in and the first thing you see is a, a slab. Everyone cries over. Oh, I didn't know. So I, I didn't get involved in part of the tour. So I just walked in on my own. I could see people crying over this slab. And there was an American tourist there. And he actually got, he was my guide. He's he yep. an old guy. He's, oh, I've been here several times. I go, what's happening here? And he goes, well, this, when Jesus died, they actually put him on this slab and they cleaned him up. Right. I said, you're kidding. Okay. So that was the first stage. You walk through into the church, you see that. And then everyone walks over to this. It looked like a, a monument where someone can stand in it. And they said, well, that's where Mary stood watching these right. people clean her son. I thought, wow. So you go to that stage as well. There's a priest there. And then you walk uh, a little bit. So you, you, you head towards the stairs, and as you get towards the stairs, you see a glass plate behind this wall, and there was a crack in it. And he goes, that's proof that when Jesus died, the earth cracked. I thought, wow, okay. So mm-hmm. you see that, and you walk up the stairs, and then you join this queue. Supposedly, the queue leads to where Jesus was crucified. Right. So they say they've still got the hole. So I, I joined the queue, got there, and... Um, See this hand, Tom? Mm-hmm. His hand went in the hole, mate. So Wrong hand, mate. Like, Your left hand? Yeah, I used my left hand. <laughs> Left-handed. Yeah. So I went in. Again, there was another priest. It was a big uh, bucket of money. So apparently yeah. you, you put money in as well. And you and I took a photo. Yeah, but it was all rendered. It seemed nice, but that was, they say that was right. where the hole was. Yeah, okay. where Jesus got crucified. And underneath was proof that the earth cracked. Wow. Yeah, so it was interesting really interesting stuff, isn't it? It is, and the whole time you'd see people, like groups of people, like Filipinos and Americans and Canadians and all different types of uh, countries and religions coming through, and they were actually holding crosses, and women were crying and so forth. Yeah, yeah amazing place. You've got to check it out. But yeah, that was I can't wait to go. Yeah, and they do it really good. You know, it's it's presented really well, and it's a fascinating city, Jerusalem. My God, yeah. there's so much going on there. I could talk forever on that stuff, yeah. but but yeah, that was it. That was uh, the Holy Sepulchre. And it's funny you just mentioned that. Yeah. You just brought back all those memories. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's come back to how we celebrate Easter in the diaspora. Let's talk about the Fashion Parade. Okay, well. <laughs> we spoke about it with Mary a few weeks ago with Mary Kustis. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should actually have a listen to that, what we actually discussed there. Yeah, 
Let's play that. I know for me growing up, church was the place where I would wear my best outfit and I'm not talking about what my mother wanted me to wear. I was very fashion forward and it was my little runway, you know, you know, walking down the aisle for me was God's runway. And <laughs> you know, and that's where I went to show my wares and my hairs. And, you know, I pitied anyone that didn't quite get where I was at because yeah. I thought I was pioneering Piuskseriti. You know, I was always yeah. big on fashion. I still am. I love it. And it so, still is like that. I'm sure it still is like that. It is, you know. It's a fashion um, parade going to church. But it was hard, especially in our day. We didn't understand what they were saying. Yeah, yeah exactly. Did we? Now no. at least, like, they'll say stuff in English and we're getting mm. our heads around it. But certainly in those days, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. So I remember, you know, comics were really big and all the little kids would sit at the back reading comics because mm. there were no iPads. Yeah. But certainly you had to find something to amuse yourself with or, you know, get a bit of status from. Yeah. I mean, she's right, isn't she? I mean, it, it really is a fashion parade every year, isn't it? It is, yeah. you got to pick your best outfit. I guess it goes back to the story of my mum's ancestors. You know, you buy new clothes for Easter and that's what they would do to attend this fashion parade as now we know as Easter. Yeah. It's not just the women, though. The girls are, you know, dolled up like laternes, as they say mm. in Greek. <laughs> yeah. You know, wearing wearing their absolute best. Even the guys. I mean, there's, you know, some of the suits pretty schmick. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> Hugo Boss suits and yeah. so forth. Yeah, they don't muck around at Easter time, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, and the women, yeah, it's like they're dressed up for a nightclub, aren't they? Yeah. Let alone church. <laughs> you know, their hair done, you know, spent so many, they go to the hairdressers yeah. and so forth. But they say that's where you can find your potential bride or groom. You ever Is that right? Of? Well, that's how they used to say back in the day. You know, everyone dresses up really nice. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. You find a good good person from church. So. Like like Mary said, to show my wares and my hairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's a classic. Oh, dear. Good stuff. Well, uh, yeah, look, it still very much is a little bit like that. So much of what makes Easter time so special is the food and the smells. You know, the really good stuff is obviously the meat mm-hmm. on the Sunday, you know, obviously because of Nistia. But let's start with Tzwedeki. For sweet those who bread. don't know, yes, uh, Easter sweet bread. It's like kind of like a brioche, which is plaited. Does your mum make it? Have you ever made it? Do you have someone in the family that makes it? My mum. Yep. She makes it for everyone. She'll yeah. probably make 20 of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And sometimes they put an egg in the middle, yes. red egg in the middle. Every family gets distributed. And that, they actually swap Tzwedekia. Yeah. So one family will cook some, give one to theirs, and then yep. everyone tastes it. Hmm, did a good one this year. Yeah. Or you know, Thea down the road did a really good one this yeah. year. Or your, you know, your 2019 Tzwedekia was the best I've ever had. And it is a bit of a competition, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> they should join that Easter show that we have. You know, they have that bread baking competition. That is a top idea. Mate, they, do well. they do well. They do well. Jeez, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, they do. They do all that sort of stuff at the Easter show, don't they? They do. Like your pie bakes and your jams and all that sort of stuff. It's mate. That's mate, the that's the way to do it. We could do one. <laughs> We're onto something here. Yeah. Maybe maybe we should uh, maybe we should have our own stand there. Uzo talk Tsureki Tsureki contest. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hand pick half yeah. a dozen and have a winner. Uzo talk champ. Oh, champ. We're gonna put on a lot of. A lot of weight during that time, mate. Yeah, it's it's all about it being light, though. Mm. A lot of people make it, and because they, uh, you know, they need it a little bit too much, or they, you know, leave it in the machine too much, mm-hmm. it comes out and it's heavy. Mm. You know, it's too dense. Mm. My, my wife actually does a really good job of it every every year because mm-hmm. I mean, she's got a bit of a background as a pastry chef, yeah. <laughs> which makes it <laughs> always yeah. helps. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever it's really light and fluffy. Mm-hmm. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. And apparently, according to her, you know, you put too much machlepi in it, which is that, you know, it's kind of signature smell. Okay. And it makes it a little bit too bitter. Put too much machlepi in it and you've ruined it, apparently. So it's this this sort of balance between machlepi, masticha and all the other mm. all the other smells. Yeah. Look, the best time to eat it, for me, it's straight out of the oven. Yeah. Yeah. Two, three days. It's still good, but that's the best time to have it. It doesn't get better. Sort of... Because it's all natural ingredients as well. It deteriorates in, in flavour and yeah. taste the more you leave it. But I tend to put it in the microwave. I've had it for three or four days. <laughs> chuck it in the microwave. It's probably the best you're going to get. Yeah. Oh, I love it. You want me to change your life? Yes. Okay. Cut a piece. Yep. Put it in the toaster for a little bit. Toaster. And then put Nutella on it. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> 
I've just ruined it for you. Is that a diaspora thing? Oh, it must be. <laughs> well, look, in Greece, you know, the, the, the big thing over there, there's obviously big companies like uh, like Terken Lee, based in Thessaloniki, mm-hmm. who do Tsureka, yeah, and they cover them in chocolate. You can, you can get them here now as well. Okay. That's a huge thing over there, and you get it all year round. Yeah. Right? Okay. So they make Tsureki, they plait it, they do whatever it, you know, they've got sure. to do to it, yeah. and they cover it in chocolate. It is fantastic. Okay. <laughs> it's the greatest thing you're ever going to have. There's other people here, for example, who do like an apple pie filling in, inside it as well, like a cherry filling, you know, so it's inside each of the plats. And then they cover it with a, you know, you know either ganache or something, something along those lines. It is unbelievable. Fantastic. So they've modernized the Tsureki yeah. now. You've got to get that into your life, mate. Yeah. It's fantastic. I'm a traditionalist. Yeah. yeah. I like the sound of all that. I think that's what I'm going to get you for Easter, mate. I'm going to get you a Tsureki that's covered in chocolate. Fantastic. I'm going to change your life. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. yeah. Put on weight, mate. Thanks for that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, beautiful. <clears throat> and what about um, Gura Bieves and all that sort of stuff? Gura Luria, oh, yeah. does your mum make all that and Dimitra make all that? My wife does all that sort of stuff. Mum doesn't really do the the sweets. Mm-hmm. That's more my wife's domain. Dimitra always does, yeah. She's got, she usually does batch of kurabieves and, you know, kuluria, all that sort of stuff, as well as the tsureki. Yeah. That makes up her plate, you know, the plate that you give out to everyone. Okay, you know, beautiful. It's always fantastic. Yeah. Always. <laughs> do you ever have the, the kurabiedha shirt where you got the white dust down your shirt? The cocaine shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, of course. It's, it's, you know, it's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Say hello to my little friend. That's right. One bite and you wear it all down your shirt. Ah, that's, it. that's a good kurabieda, that one. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> now, she's good like that because she's she makes, um, you know, the actual uh, the shortbread mm-hmm. is really buttery. So it's this combination. Again, it's it's really light. Yep. You know, so you've got this sort of light shortbread, um, short crust or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Covered in the, you know, in the, the zakariachni. You don't need tea, you don't need coffee, just by itself. Yeah. Beautiful. Far, I'm actually salivating now. I could have used one of them with my coffee this morning. Yeah. <laughs> hey? Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. And then all the men get the adni out, eh? That's it. I think we already covered that, didn't we, in the barbecue episode? If you need some tips on how to do your suvla or your barbecue or whatever, check out the barbecue episode that we did a, a few months back. What was it? Episode three, I think it was. Good episode. We got a little bit loose on that episode. <laughs> we did. We the Barbayani was, uh, was was flowing thick and fast. <laughs> yeah. Did we uh, come to an agreement in the end? I think it ended up being the, the quality of the produce. Yeah. So the better the quality, the less ingredients you need. Absolutely. When you've got good produce, don't ruin it with, with too much stuff. Go sparingly. Yeah. Always use a, you know, good salt and pepper. Good origani. Good, good origani, but don't overdo it with a... With things like garlic and all that, all that sort of stuff. The only yeah. thing that we didn't really agree on was the olive oil. Okay, <laughs> you remember? Yeah, and so, rigani before or after? I yeah. Think. So my, like I said, my family and my uh, my petero, who you know, who runs a restaurant and all that mm-hmm. sort of thing, refuses to put oil on it because he's like, this is a fatty animal mm. for a start, and we'll only put oregano on it after cutting it. Mm. So it's cooked. Butchers it all up, you know, ready for serving, and we'll put uh, oregano on it afterwards. Mm. And lavo lemon if you want after that. You know what okay. I mean? So, I hear paprika is very popular as well. A couple of mm. islands I know, Limnos and so forth, they yeah, love right. adding the paprika on there. Yeah. You'll be paprika fan? On chicken, the codosuvli or something like that. Yeah. Haven't really tried it on lamb though. Yeah, I've had a couple of lamb suvli in my time where they've spread paprika all over it, oregano, you know, heaps of salt pepper they actually put uh, a hard cheese in the belly of it before they serve oh really mm. okay garlic and onions and so forth and they and they stab the inside of it actually they stab it right through yeah, right. so when the cheese melts it goes right through the meat and, yeah, right. and so forth yeah fantastic it is and um we've got uh, some good traditions mate we do we do we love it <laughs> Just remind you of the story as well. A couple of years ago, we were having a chat about this, how you do your suvla and so forth. There's a family in the 80s. So back then, remember the suvla, it was all done by hand. Yes. You had to wheel around, you had to rotate, use your left hand, your right hand. And then a couple of uh, you know bright sparks. I thought, you know what, let's just put a motor to it. He you must know? have been Greek. <laughs> of course, you know, the Greek engineer hat comes on. Yep. Yeah, we can... We can 
do this better, you know? Yep. So there's a couple of guys back in the 80s who had a really good idea of putting a motorized mechanism on this spit. And one of the guys had a uh, old washing machine he was getting rid of. <laughs> and he goes, you know what? Grab the motor from the washing machine. We'll chuck it on here. So a week before Easter, these three blokes got together and, th- and they worked it out. They, they ripped out this washing machine <laughs> motor <laughs> and they put it on and they tested it. Yep. You know, they, you know, like a good engineer, you test it first and they tested it. They get, and they were, you know, very pleased with themselves and weakening at each other and they were fist pumping and high fiving. I think we've worked it out here. Yeah. Again, this is in the 80s. Back then it was all still done by hand yep. and motorized was sort of coming in in the late 80s, early 90s. But these guys went one step further, got this washing machine motor, all happened, it was all ready to go. Anyway, so all the Easter festivities kicked in. Sunday morning, they all got together. They did the charcoal. They marinated the, the lamb. Good, you know, 15 kilo size lamb. Yep. Put it on. They turned on the, the power and the switch and then things started to turn automatically. The whole group that were there, the women, everyone was impressed. Going, yep. Oh my God, how good is this? <laughs> the guys are cheering, sipping on the Rusa. How smart are we? Where's this going? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it went for about half hour. Then they switched off the power. Yep. They readjusted it again, touched it up again, switched on the power again, and then uh, they left it. So it takes, what, good three hours, yep. four hours sometimes? Uh, anyway, so this started. This thing started rotating. It was going good. They're all sitting around. Now and then at the trapezi, they'd look over and they'd admire their work. They'd go, how good's this? And they'd look at their mates. They'd wink at each other. Mate, you succeed on their mate. Two hours into it, they just, as they're sitting around, they started looking at this thing and it started spinning quicker. Yeah. They started going quicker. All of a sudden, this thing was out of control. It was spinning so fast that the shit, they all jumped out of their seats, <laughs> trying to grab the handle, trying to stop it. It lasts for about 30 seconds, and this thing started just to break apart. Yep. It started flying off, and the thing just collapsed. There was meat flinging everywhere. <laughs> Everyone got scared. Go, what? This thing's possessed. What's happened? It's bad luck. <laughs> yeah, it's bad luck. And they're all freaking out, trying to all scratch in their heads. And by the time they worked out, they could just switch off the power. This thing had broken apart. You know, the, the leg of lamb went flying off into the backyard. Um, <laughs> it had collapsed. You know, charcoal fell on the ground. And they worked out that this washing machine motor... Was on spin mode. Was on spin mode, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had an adjust... Well, I don't know what they did. They just grabbed the motor and it got to spin cycle and the thing just kicked oh, in, geez. you know, two hours into it. The spin cycle kicked in. <laughs> And this lamb was just spinning 100 miles an hour and just broke apart. Outstanding. It was so funny, but the way the <laughs> guy described it. And they had a dog in the backyard. and oh, He must have been happy. Yeah, the dog was happy and the women were all freaking out. They tried to salvage some of it. Apparently they did. And ended up being, you know, admissed to food and all. Like yeah, they, of course. They salvaged some of it. Oh, fuck, chuck what's left in the oven. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was the funniest sight. Yeah, and they're all so proud of themselves, <laughs> winking all of a sudden, this thing just went out of control like it was possessed. Yeah, it was a funny sight. But anyway, that was that one Easter. I'll never forget, will they? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised nobody did it with a drill back then, you know, like using like a power drill or something like that to, mm. to do the rotation. Yeah, it's funny how times change. You yeah. can go to Bunnings and get one for 20 bucks now. That's it. Yeah. Oh, there's good There's good ones at Bunnings, actually. For, yeah. for, I think it's about 70 bucks for a little jumbuck. Yeah. You know, a little souvla. You won't fit a whole lot of meal on it, but uh, you can definitely do a good souvla on that yeah. or a chicken or a leg of lamb or something like that. Definitely. Beautiful stuff. Yeah. And yeah, you've got your motor in there. Yeah, definitely. We're modernized, mate. Yeah. What about the red eggs? We talk, again, we spoke a little bit about this with Mary. What's the trick? Yeah. The, co- the competition is insane yeah. every year. <laughs> it's furious competition between yeah. the family. Yeah, look, you know, what brings great memories, actually. I remember my mum would be in the kitchen. She'd go in the backyard and she'd grab leaves and she'd grab stockings and the leaves would go on the egg and then she'd wrap stockings around the, yep. the eggs and, and she'd put red dye through them. Okay. And uh, and then she'd take the stocking off and you'd have this beautiful image of a, a oh, leaf yeah. on the side of the egg. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I remember, I remember those days. And I used to help my mum with it as well, put them in the stockings and tying it up. And I so always forth. wondered how they did that because what, my family never did those patterns. Okay, yeah. Well, I had an aunt who, <clears throat> I had an aunt who used to do that. Mm-hmm. But I never, yeah, never, never got to see how they actually did that. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you just brought back all these fond memories. 
And mum would sit there a week out making, you know, shitload of eggs. And there was always red, I remember. And then yep. now and then she she broke it up, put a bit of green in there. Mm-hmm. And then one year we had like blue. I thought, wow, yeah. what's, what does that mean, mum? She's like, oh, yeah. It was on Doesn't sale. Break. The colour was on sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I remember, yeah, the old Christos Anesti and Alithos Anesti. Yeah. yeah, the technique. Well, they say the technique, yeah, if you squeeze the end of it with your fingers, it makes it yeah. harder. What I've found, I don't know if there's any science behind this, but it's usually the darker eggs that are the strongest. Okay, because they've got more a coat of paint over the top. I, yeah, so may, to maybe something like maybe they they absorb more of the dye mm. and it thickens it some you know somehow. But mm-hmm. I've never seen one of the lighter eggs be the the victorious egg. No, nah. it's always one of the dark ones, dark and small. Okay, yeah, yeah. I like that. That's yeah, my dark uh, and that's, small. That's my approach. Yeah, it does make sense. <laughs> yeah. Or use the wooden one. The wooden one, yes, that's right. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think my brother tried to do that one year. Yeah, how did yeah. it go? Yeah, ah, oh, he just beat everyone until we worked out what he was doing. Yeah, he said, "Hey, hey, cheat." There's always the allegation. Yeah, there's always the allegation at the table. Let me see it. Yeah, my my uncle Harry. Oh my god, if you've got an egg that's working, he'll say, "Okay, give us a look at it." And you'll throw, you know, you'll put your hand out, and he'll yeah. just grab your hand and crush it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Maybe we should explain to the non-Greek listeners out there what this is all about. Yeah, so we've got this little competition at the dinner table. Two red eggs, one pointy end up. So, you know, one person says Christ is risen. The other one responds with truly is risen. And you sort of, uh, you know, hit each other's egg with it. The one that doesn't crack is the winner. Correct. Yeah, and you got to go point to point. Yep. And then, as we say, bum to bum. Yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> apparently the bum is more solid. Uh, the bum is, is the softer part. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's the that's the one that's most likely to crack. Yeah, and how funny is it after that competition ends, you got all these cracked eggs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you lose, you just grab another one. You don't eat it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> we, my dad would always take the eggs. He'd make like a like an egg salad mm. sort of thing. You know, Beautiful. just put your mayo in it or whatever. You'd put that in sandwiches afterwards. You know, something like that. Yeah. It's a good way to use them. It is, yeah. <laughs> but um, you, ta- you take them to work mm. and everyone's looking at you saying, what's wrong with that egg? Yeah. <laughs> like got these red eggs sitting on your, on your desk. Seat. Yeah, and sometimes the, the dye seeps through. Yeah. So you've got the egg white with like a red stripe through yeah, it. Yeah, correct. <laughs> I always loved freaking people out at work, you know, when they would, you know, bring a couple of red eggs out or whatever. It's like, what's going on there? And, you know, you'd have like <laughs> dye on your hands and yeah, <laughs> your hands are covered in red. And it got quite competitive. I guess <clears throat> our family's very competitive as well. So we'd always try and win and get the shits yeah. if we didn't win. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like you said, like your Uncle Harry, we'd have people in our family would, you know, just blow up and crush your egg. You know, <laughs> spoiled sport. Yeah. <laughs> Cheated. Uh, oh dear. Uh, good Love old days. Well, yeah. I can't wait for it this year. Actually, speaking of food, you haven't touched on this. What about Mayeritsa? Oh, yeah, Mayeritsa. Yeah. The, do, do you like the Mayeritsa? Me personally, love it. Okay. Love it. But it is a, an acquired taste, isn't it? Yeah, it is. For those who don't know, Mayeritsa is effectively gut soup. <laughs> so, the, so the lamb that's been slaughtered for. Lamb gut soup. Yeah. Yes. The lamb that's been slaughtered for the for the souvla for the for the spit, you basically take the offal from it and you're making it into a soup. And not everyone enjoys it. That's like the midnight dish yep. for for Easter. It is. Your mum makes it definitely. Yeah. Well, not now. We don't really eat it, but yeah, she used to make it. Yeah. She used to say it takes forever to make because you got to clean it. Yes. And clean it and over clean it and clean it again. And uh, yeah, and I remember, yeah, after church, you come in Saturday with your candle, midnight, yep. put the candle in, and the magiritsa would come out. I could never eat it. Really? Yeah, Didn't like nah, it? Never. Yeah, my brother used to eat it. Mum and dad, yeah, me, no, nah, never got into it. Really? I See, tried I really one like year, it. but just that image of, because I used to watch her make it. If you didn't see what was in there, you probably would eat it. Yeah. But I would watch her make it and clean it, and it sort of turned me off yep. as a kid. Yeah. Because mum and dad used to get a whole fucking lamp. Used to chop it up in front yep. of us, you know, and I used to watch. And they used to go to the abattoir and yep. bring it in, and the head sometimes was still attached. Yeah, and they'd eat the head. Yep. The head is for the, I guess, the head of the family. Yes, and it's a delicacy, you know, the eyeballs, the brain, the cheek. <laughs> yeah, I could never do that. Oh, I remember one year personally. I saw it, and this thing was staring at me. You know, you could still see the teeth <laughs> and the eyeballs, and like, oh my god, like. A, 
if you're a little five year old, you know, six year old, I'd I'd scar mentally scarred looking at this thing. I go, this thing's looking at me. I'd have nightmares about it. Mate, my granddad was big time into that. He loved it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. He loved it. Yeah, it was an honour too to have that. Yeah, you know, if the the patriarch of the house would have to eat it. Yeah. So the other thing that they do with the offal is obviously kokoretsu. Do you eat that? No. Really? You it looks like great. Either. It looks good. But once, because I know what it is, yeah. I don't eat it. Mate, it is fantastic. So, I mean, for those who don't know, kokoretsu is basically everything that's that we've just spoken about. So usually like uh, hearts, kidneys, liver, um, and um, the adero, so the, mm-hmm. the intestine basically. You put it on a, on a skewer and basically wrap it all up in this intestine. And look, it sounds horrible, and you'd think that it would taste, you know, taste pretty bad, but it's all in the cleaning. You know, there's a whole procedure to get this right, and especially with the intestine, you need to turn it inside out, mm. wash it with lemon juice, and uh, you know, lemons. I mean, I've seen my mum, you know, my mum and my pethera do, doing that. Yeah, you know, and, and the joke in the family, <laughs> the joke in the family is that's what you uh. do <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> so what would uh, so what happens is. They do that, and you wrap it all up. You use a bit of coal fat as well, mm-hmm. and put that on the shula. Mm. I love yeah. it. I can't get enough of it. Yeah. You know, it's so it, it's so rich and fatty and yeah, just beautiful. I love seeing it on the shula because uh, it just reminds me of the tradition. However, I just think it's a waste of space on the shula. <laughs> you putting something else, something else on there. Yeah, yeah, but I can understand it's a tradition. Yeah, it's good to have it on there. But look, I'm I'm the one with the sitting around with a fork. Uh, Peeling off Betza. the bets off the yeah. lamb. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> that's me. Love it. Yeah, I couldn't do the cockroach. Yeah, yeah. But look, it's a tradition, and that's and it's good that you you enjoy it. You know. It's, oh, I love it. I love it. We'll see. Maybe you can get me to try it one time. Well, next time we make it, I'm definitely going to give you some. Oh, a little bit. <laughs> we'll film it. We'll film <laughs> Nick's reaction to cockroach. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's yeah. I guess time heals all wounds. I yeah. guess. So, I haven't seen mum make it anymore, yeah. so I tend to forget about it. Oh, we've got to do it this year. We have to do it. <laughs> Good stuff. Love it. There's so much we can talk about, but I think we've kind of covered it for now. We want to wish everyone a Kali Anastasia. Happy Easter. Uh, hopefully you sort of listen to this podcast in the lead up to your, uh, your Easter celebration this year, wherever you are in the world. All of our listeners in Australia, in the in the US, and uh, the UK, and Greece, Canada, yeah, absolutely, all of Zambia. those countries, Zambia, Kenya, yeah. <laughs> all those countries we've listened to. However, you celebrate, we want to know about it. So, email us at uzotalk at outlook dot com. Comment on one of our uh, social media platforms at uzotalk or at uzo underscore talk on on Instagram. We want to know, how do you celebrate Easter? What, what are your traditions? Love it, Tom. And look, happy Easter, everyone. Enjoy the festive season. It's a great time of year. And uh, yeah, looking forward to all your feedback. And, yeah. it's, and it's great reminiscing as well, Tom. You brought back all these great memories. Yeah, it's fantastic reminiscing, Nick. I mean, it's all about the kids now, obviously, trying to make it really impressive and uh, special for the kids. It's all about the Easter eggs. It's all about the the chocolate. All about the tsurekia, and you know we'll uh, sort of instill the uh, you know the traditions of going to church in them as well, and pass it on to the next generation. Yeah, definitely. Look, we'll be there. We'll be there at Cobra Church. Uh, my mum will be there with her seven grandkids. That's fantastic. That's and what it's about. The tradition will live on definitely in our family. Well, guys, thanks again for tuning in. Nick, thank you very much. Tom, it's been a pleasure. As always. Coffee went down well. Yes. I think we're ready for a news though. Absolutely. Next episode. <laughs> okay, It's mate. a big one. It is. Oh, we've got a couple <laughs> of big ones coming up. Looking forward yeah. to it. Stay tuned. Yeah. Okay. Happy Easter, everyone. Kalia Anastasia. Ακολουθήστε μας στο Soundees, στο Spotify, στο Apple Podcasts και στο Google Podcasts.